singularity. Hi guys, we are visiting the Cryonics Institute today near Detroit, Michigan. And the purpose of our visit would be to tour the facilities, to find out more about the process of cryopreservation, as well as the process of potentially becoming a member and joining the community at the Cryonics Institute. Hi Andy. Hi. Thanks for having us over today. I'm glad you could make it. We would uh, like to tour the facility if that's okay. And sure. if you would please uh, show us how the process works from the beginning to the end. I'll be happy to, follow me. Thank you. So we are inside uh, the Cryonics Institute with Andy Zulaki, who has agreed to show us the facilities as well as teach us about the process of cryopreservation. From the beginning, right after the moment that legal death has been declared, until what we call uh, the patient being put in long-term storage. So Andy, tell us what happens right after, for example, I am legally pronounced to be dead. Once you're legally pronounced, the standby team would put you in a portable ice bath and the object is to cool you down as quickly as possible to above freezing temperature, probably about 15 degrees Celsius. And that's gonna be accomplished by covering you completely with crushed ice and about halfway covered up with water because circulating water cools a lot faster than ice alone. There's a pump that goes in here to spray the water over top of the patient to accelerate the cooling. On this particular ice bath we have made by Michigan Instruments is called a thumper and that keeps your heart going and it keeps oxygen going into the lungs. We also have uh, for other standby kits we have what's called a Lucas, various types but they all do the same thing it's to keep the heart going using compression. It actually uses compression, it will push down, it will pull up so you've got better circulation that way. And they're going to be kept in here and uh, the heart will be maintained and the circulation of the water maintained until they're cooled down. And at, during that time, different medications will be administered. For example, you're going to use heparin to keep the blood from clotting. You'll use Maalox in a, in a combi tube into the stomach to keep the acids in the stomach from dissolving the lining of the stomach and different types of medications are used. And then the standby team, it, depending on a situation where you died, if they can do the surgical work on the spot or in their vehicle, they'll do it there. If not, they will go to a funeral home, use the facilities at a funeral home, and then they'll wash the blood out of the body. And they'll use a cold organ preservative solution when they're washing the blood out of the body. And that will further help to cool the body. And it will also help to keep the cells alive with the organ preservative solution. Once that's accomplished, they'll then pack you in regular water ice and either get you on an air, airplane and have you transported to the facility or by vehicle, whichever is quicker. Mm -hmm. So that's basically the purpose of the mobile unit, which is basically to preserve you from the moment that you're legally declared to be dead until the moment that you are arrive at the premises of the Cryonics Institute, right. where the actual process of vitrification can begin. Is that so? Correct. Okay. so. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about the solutions that you use in order to uh, perfuse the body and prepare it for the vitrification process, as well as the machines that you use or the process that you use to get that done? Okay, sure. Well, this, this here is actually our perfusion pump and our perfusion system. It's a, it's a roller pump, a reservoir for the solutions, a filter, Filter can catch, will catch any small particles that might be in there, but it's primarily for air because you don't want any kind of air entering the, the person's circulatory system. There's also a pressure monitor, a digital pressure monitor. And the patient is cannulated, which is the, we use uh, the surgical instruments. Actually, a funeral director does the surg surgery and cannulates the patient, which is connecting the, the, the uh, perfusion pump to the arteries and open the, the vein, veins for drainage. And the type of solution we use, it's a it's combination of ethylene glycol and DMSO. It's, the solution was actually developed by a cryobiologist that worked for us at one point, And he also worked for the Immortalist Society. And 
It's done in various steps, different percentages, so that way we don't shock the system with too viscous of a solution. Mm -hmm. And it's stepped up and it comes, actually it's used out of the refrigerators. That's what you see the refrigerators for. Um, the lower percentages are refrigerated, but the higher percentages, when we get to the 70%, it actually comes out of the freezer. It's about minus 18 when it's being circulated into the body. And the perfusion, depending on the situation, in the case of the patient, can go anywhere from an hour and a half up to about three hours or so. And during that time, we monitor the effluents coming out of the patient. And that's when we, we use a refractometer. We measure the refractive index. When the refractive index matches the, reaches the same measurements of what's going in as what's coming out, it means that the body is saturated, the tissue is saturated, it can't take up anymore. And that's when we know when to quit. We also bur, um, put burr holes in the skull to monitor for swelling. And you can also monitor visual, you know, the face for swelling. If we get any type of swelling, then we're going to stop because you don't want to have any kind of pressure put on the brain and swelling. So um, a patient that gets a good standby gets to us quickly. You usually don't have any kind of edema, no swelling at all. A patient that may not have had the best standby or might not have got a standby or possibly a sudden death, then you're going to be a lot more careful monitoring for swelling because they're going to, they're going to be more susceptible to the edema. Mm -hmm. So Andy, once the tissues have reached the required degree of uh, solution saturation, then what's the next step towards placing the body in long-term storage? The next step is to cool them down to liquid nitrogen temperature. And how long does that process take? It takes about five and a half days. We have a computer controlled cooling unit to do it. If you want to come with me, I can show you. Oh, fantastic. Let's have a look. This is a computer controlled cooling unit. It's designed for one person. It operates, the cooling mechanism is using nitrogen gas, and it does require electricity to operate. We have backup batteries, so that way if we're ever doing a cool down, we get a power outage, storm or anything, the batteries will continue to operate to, to keep the unit running so there's no disruption in the cooling. It's a, very, it's a simple controller, thermocouple. The patient is placed inside, the thermocouples are placed inside to monitor the temperatures. Um, this big line you see here is connected to our liquid nitrogen bulk tank behind the building. It holds three gallons or 3,000 gallons of liquid nitrogen. It comes through here. Its solenoid valve is what controls the gas going in and out. We've got different programs for different circumstances, whether we get a person just vitrified here or uh, in Europe, for example. We'll choose the right program, program it, start it and it just operates on its own. It takes about five and a half days to cool a person down to vitrification temperature, or to vitrify them, cool them down to liquid nitrogen temperature. And it's a matter of just, the program just opens and closes the valve as it needs to cool it. And how do you monitor, for example, the rate of cooling down between 110 pound woman and a 250 pound guy? Because so, I imagine that the rate of cooling of one body would be very different to the rate of cooling to another body. Is that correct? It, they cool, uh, it will take longer for a larger person to reach the liquid nitrogen temperature, but they're gonna cool fairly at the same rate. Well, I should say, the, we use the same program, it's just gonna have to run longer is all. Mm -hmm. But we always run them for five and a half days at least. But if the person is larger, then we'll go six days or six and a half days if we have to. But we Do have, you have a way of monitoring how that, that process of cooling is developing? We, we, watch, we monitor the temperature inside of the unit. We have laptop computers that actually chart the temperature as it goes down. Mm -hmm. And once they're, once they're down to the liquid nitrogen temperature, we'll hold them for an hour at, the, at that point. But if it's a bigger person, as I said, we'll, we can hold them longer. And what's the final temperature that you're going for in this unit? We want one minus 196, but we get about minus 195 or so because mm -hmm. the liquid nitrogen evaporates at that point, so we run them down to liquid nitrogen temperature. So Andy, let's say that the process of cooling down of the patient has already been completed. Then what's the next step towards long-term storage? 
Well, it would be moving them just from the cooling chamber into one of the cryostats. We've got, actually, we've got several different generations of cryostats that we built. The first generation were cylinders, similar to the ones we're using now, but they're built a little differently and are also built for one, the first one was for one patient, second one was for two patients. As we got more and more patients, just wasn't economical to build them. Then we decided to go to rectangulars, and this is the first rectangular model, and it actually does have wall-to-wall -wall support on the inside. Well, wall-to-wall -wall support can conduct heat, and it's not as efficient as if there was no support. So with that, we come up with the third generation, which is this one here that holds 14 patients. The one over there holds 10 patients. There is no wall-to-wall -wall support on the sides, only on the bottom for, for holding the weight. And heat can be con transferred by conduction, convection, and radiation. So if you put, if you remove the supports, you're not going to have any conduction through there. So it makes it more efficient. And a lot of insulation is going to take the distance away, which would reduce the radiation, and you pull a vacuum on it, and you don't have the convection. The, they're very efficient, but they're also very time-consuming to build and expensive because of all the heavy ribbing. So after that, they do take less floor space, but we decided that the expense of the rectangulars, saving a smaller amount of floor space, really wasn't worth it because we were putting the money back into the materials and time to build it. So we went to a fourth generation, which is similar to the first, but they're larger, and they're over here. So this is basically the fourth generation latest design unit for long-term storage. Correct. And as you can see, we've got about 16 of them here. We've got one in the back that we're going to be fireproofing. Uh, painting the fireproof material on them. We just got that from the manufacturer, and we've got another one ordered that they're working on. So this, that's, this is the type that we're going to be sticking with. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the design of these units? Because to tell you the truth, I'm quite impressed that, you know, those are at what temperature inside? Minus 196 Celsius, which is about minus 320 Fahrenheit, so almost 400 degrees colder. Yeah, and I'm absolutely amazed that there's not even a condensation on the outside of the unit. Right. It's and a, it doesn't even feel cold to the touch. That's how well insulated it it's is. It's a very good insulator. It's perlite. Perlite is a mineral that gets baked. It expands. It pops similar to popcorn. Then it gets ground real fine. So it's a very, very fine powder inside of there. And then we pull a vacuum on it out of the insulation. Remove all the air. So then you don't have the, um, the convection currents in there that would transfer heat from the outside to the inside. So you pull a vacuum on it, and you're increasing the efficiency by a factor of 10. So you get a good vacuum, you're going to use a tenth of the liquid nitrogen. These cylinders, their outside shell is 6 foot diameter, inside shell is 4 foot diameter. We, full, we hold 6 full body patients in each one. We only, actually, we only store full body patients. We only provide that service for full body suspensions. Each one holds 6. Um, there is room in them near the top there where we can put pets, which helps us to store them m much more efficiently. At some point, um, we might devote one individual for pet storage, but we don't need to, and it's very economical to do it this way. Now, you said that each of those uh, containers actually has six patients. Correct. Are they heads up or heads down? They're all stored head down. The reason they're and stored head down, I'm sure you probably know, is, is so that if the last, it, that would be the last thing to ever be thought if there was an emergency. If for some reason we can't get liquid nitrogen supplies, which hasn't happened, but you never know. There could be civil unrest, there could be a war, there could be something, a ca catastrophe of some sort. So the last thing that we would want to be thought would of course be the brain. So they're all stored head down. So, speaking of emergency, one of the most uh, commonly submitted audience questions is, what happens when you guys lose electricity? How do you sustain that very low temperature on the inside of the units? The temperature is sustained by liquid nitrogen, not by electricity. It's like if you have your freezer unplugs or goes out, then you have a problem. Not, not the case here. This is just by replenishing the liquid nitrogen as it boils off. I reload the liquid nitrogen in these about once a week. You can go a couple weeks without a problem, but we don't need to do that because we've got a good supply of it and it's better to top it off regularly. If you, when I was testing these, I let them boil down completely empty and they'll go six months before they actually empty out. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely fantastic. So perhaps the, one of the last questions that I have for you today is, 
pets. Can you tell us about pets and where and how you preserve them? Or if you have a specifically designed units for pets? Well, with pets, we actually, we have some in here, the smaller pets. And these are actually the only commercial doors that we have. Um, they're placed in here. It's the larger pets are actually stored in with the people. Mm -hmm. How many pets uh, would you be able to store in a unit like this one? It would depend on the size. I mean, cats, you could probably fit, I would say, about a dozen cats in here. We don't have that many in here. We also have DNA samples, and we because we store DNA samples for our members. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thanks very much for a fascinating tour, Andy. I would also like to ask you a few questions about the general mission of the Cryonics Institute, as well as the process by which new members may be allowed to join your community and take advantage of your facility and your services. So. Who would be the best person to give me that information? Well, David Ettinger would be a good one to talk to about that. I can introduce you to him. Fantastic. Let's go talk to David then. Okay.